Welcome. We are kicking off a brand new series today called Teach Us to Pray. And I want to start off by asking a question uh, just to kind of get us thinking uh, along the right lines during our time together. Have you ever seen something that someone else had and you wanted it? Have you ever seen so? And now, now I'm not talking about a Lamborghini. It, it, have you ever seen something in someone else's life, and you're like, "Man, I want that." M- maybe it's it's a, a, a quality, or or a characteristic in someone else's life. And you're like, "Man, I just I just wish I had that uh, in my life." Uh, this is exactly what happened to the disciples. The twelve disciples saw something different in Jesus' life. And because they saw this different thing, they asked him a question. And that question uh, really is the theme verse for this whole series that we're kicking off today, Teach Us to Pray. And so let's look at this theme verse. It's found in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And, And the Bible says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And so literally what's happening here is they saw him praying. They saw him doing something, and they said, we want that. We wish that it would be like that for us as well. Now, it's interesting uh, when you think about this question. In answer to this is what uh, Jesus' response is, what we commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer. But based on this, we see it's not the Lord's Prayer, it's the disciples' prayer. He's telling the disciples not even what to pray, but how to pray. He's giving them a model prayer to follow. And and so we'll talk a little bit about the the Lord's Prayer uh, in this series, but but more so it's answering that question that Jesus answered, uh, the question when the disciples asked him, you know, will you teach us to pray? Just like John the Baptist taught his disciples as well. So here's the thing about prayer, and and I want to share in this this series, and and I'm actually getting a little help, uh, and you'll find out about that uh, as we work our way through this series uh, from some other folks, but but we want to share just real practically uh, our struggles with prayer, some of the things that we've learned about prayer, in in the hopes that it'll help you too, and, and really that we can help to teach you, based on the scripture, how to pray. Because you know what, uh, prayer is really, really hard uh, when, when there's something missing. When there's something missing, it makes prayer really, really difficult. And, and so the big question, I, I think, is what's missing? What, what's missing? For many of us, prayer is a real, real struggle. And I think there's a number of reasons why that prayer is a struggle. And, and I want to share some of those reasons that I think it, it, there's something missing and it makes prayer a real struggle. Here's the first one. I feel ashamed. I feel ashamed. And there's a second one, too. I feel obligated. (laughs) So we're just going to move right on to number two. I feel obligated. Maybe we feel ashamed uh, of something in our past, and, and, uh, you you know, it's like, well, you know, I can't pray. I can't talk to God because of what I did a month ago or a year ago or a day ago. Or or maybe we feel obligated, like, oh, I got to do this prayer thing again. Oh boy, here it comes, you know, and, and, and it's just no fun. It's just drudgery. It's like when you're a kid, when you have to do chores. I mean, who gets excited about that? No one. And, and so if we see prayer as an obligation, something's missing. Or maybe this, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I, I think a lot of Christians, a lot of Christ followers, they just don't know what to say. I mean, how do I talk to God? Like, who am I to talk to God at all? How, what would I even say? And so rather than learning how, we just ignore it. But prayer is such an important thing. Or, or how about this, uh, this th- maybe missing something in prayer if we feel like this, I don't think he's listening. I don't, I, I don't think he's listening. Well, God is listening. Well, one of the, the qualities of God in theology, we use this big word, omnipresence, and that means all of God is everywhere simultaneously. But it means something even greater than that. And I remember when I first discovered this in, in reading, man, it just changed my world. It's not only that all of God is everywhere simultaneously throughout all creation, but it also means this. Every single one of us has God's undivided attention every moment of our life. Think about that. There's not a moment in your life that God has ever looked the other way. That's his omnipresence. 
each one of us lives out our life in front of him with his undivided attention. And so he's listening. Here's another one. I don't want to bother him. <laughs> I don't want to bother him. I mean, like he's, he's trying to take care of these huge things, you know, these huge issues. It's no bother. It's no bother at all. Jesus said that even a sparrow doesn't fall from the ground, fall to the ground without our Heavenly Father knowing about it. It's no bother. And, and so sometimes it's, I don't want to bother him. Or how about this one? I don't trust him. I don't trust him. You know, because if I pray, <laughs> if I pray, he, he, may, he may give me an answer I don't want. And, and, and I'm not so sure I can handle that. You know, if I start praying, if I start talking to God and, and, and really he, he, uh, he, he starts saying some stuff to me, I mean, he may make me like sell everything and go be a missionary in Africa. That was what I was worried about for a large part of my uh, uh, teenage years. Not that there's anything wrong with Africa. It just wasn't for me, understand? But, but, uh, but the, here's the point. I heard someone say this one time, and it just freed me up so much. He said, if God ever showed you what his plan is for your life, you would say yes to it immediately because it's what he created you for. It would be your very dream come true. You can trust him. You can trust him. Here's the last reason why maybe something's missing. I don't get an answer. I don't get an answer. M maybe you're praying just like, and, you, and you, just don't, you just don't get an answer. You're just wondering, God, where's the answer? Why, are you listening? You know, how come other people, you know, kind of pray and they feel like, you know, God spoke to me and, 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 uh, and you just don't feel like you're getting an answer? Well, all of those reasons, each one of these reasons, really, there, it shows that there's something missing in prayer. And that's what I want to talk about in our time together, the difference. What is the difference maker when it comes to prayer? That there is, there is one thing that really eliminates every single one of those false ideas or false feelings. It is the difference maker when it comes to prayer. Here it is, let me put it this way. There's a difference between a relationship prayer and a rescue prayer. There's a big difference between a prayer that, that's birthed out of relationship and one that is really a rescue prayer. Now, I can't think of how appropriate this series is. God knew, we decided on this a while back, but God knew, given the events of, of, of this week and the, and the shooting in Charleston, South Carolina, in a church, and, and uh, I even put on our, our church Facebook page and on my personal profile, you know, we need to pray and how to pray for those and the, the victims and their families and law enforcement and all the, in Charleston, South Carolina. But, but here's the thing, for many people, Something like this happens, and they begin to pray, and we should begin to pray. But then a week goes by, and everything stops in terms of prayer. And then another crisis comes up, or we want a job, or we're looking for a spouse, or, or we need something, and prayer starts again because of something that we need. That's rescue prayer. That's rescue prayer. And rescue prayer is missing what prayer is really all about. Should we pray rescue type prayer? Absolutely. But more important than rescue prayer is relationship prayer, is relationship prayer. Like, like for me, for instance, my wife Susie and I, we have three daughters, three children. If my girls only talked to me when they needed something, that, that'd really start to kind of bug me after a while. It, it would say to me, what would bug me is this, we don't have much of a relationship if it's just you come to me when there's something that you want. And see, with God, I'm not saying it bugs him. I am saying he wants more from us and for us than just, God, this is what I want you to do for me. Or do even for someone else. It's about relationship. Let me put it this way, and this is a big key, really, for this whole series. Real prayer is driven by relationship, not need or crisis. The, the kind of prayer that, that changes things, that, that, that really impacts reality and moves God, 
is driven by relationship, not need or crisis. Now, now there may be need in it, but, it, but it's more about the relationship. It, it's about connecting with the heart of God and allowing God's heart to connect with ours. It's so, so important when it comes to prayer. I love how uh, David wrote in Psalm 27, verses seven and eight, he said, hear me as I pray, O Lord, be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. God is saying to every single one of us, every one of his followers, come and talk to me. Come and talk to me. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. Isn't that beautiful? David, who was a man after God's own heart, God himself said that about David in the Bible, he understood that God is saying, come talk to me. Come and talk to me. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel obligated. Even if you don't know what to say, uh, if you don't think I'm listening, uh, if you don't want to bother me, if you feel like you can't trust me, if you feel like you won't get an answer, God says, come and talk to me. This is the truth of Scripture, regardless of any of those other things that we may actually feel. This is the truth. God says, I want a relationship with you. Come and talk with me. And our response of our heart should be, Lord, here I am. I'm coming to talk to you. And, and so I, I want to talk about how this does, how, what, what is prayer out of relationship? What does that really look, look like? Four different things that, that I think real practically, and, and boy, I don't know a more practical message series than this series is Teach Us to Pray. Uh, and, and real practical that I think are things I've discovered that I think are going to help you as well and all found in the scripture. Uh, first of all, start with worship. Start with worship. But when we start to pray, when we begin to pray, start with worship. This is what Jesus said in that model prayer called the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, Matthew's account of it. Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Now, we don't use that word hallowed very often. And, and so, let me unpack that a little bit for us. Hallowed be your name. That word hallowed means to lift up, to greatly revere or respect. What is that? Worship. Worship. And, and really, that's what when we gather together like this, what do we do? We, we don't just pop open the Bible and start. What do we do? We worship. We revere. We lift up the name of Jesus. We, we worship God. And, and there's something about it when we worship God, you know what happens inside of us? It begins to make a difference in our attitude and in the atmosphere around us. It doesn't change him, it changes us. When, when we get to forget about ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. It's, it's a game changer. That's what Jesus was talking about. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, let me just point out something else that's pretty interesting. Who did Jesus say to pray to? The Father. Talk to the Father. Very, very interesting. You can read all the prayers out the New Testament. They're addressed to the Father. The Father. Not to Jesus, not to the Holy Spirit. They have their roles in the Trinity, God themselves, but it's to the Father, our Father. And don't you love this? Our Father. We're in the family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Worship makes a difference in the atmosphere and in our attitude as well. And this is, a, this, this is what it means, just this heart that's open to God as we worship him, as you start with worship. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 4, verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit of that's by the Holy Spirit, capital S right there. And in truth, what does that mean? Honesty, openness. Honesty and openness. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Pretty interesting, Jesus said in the Gospels of the disciples, he says, this generation, uh, in, in the Gospels to the Pharisees rather, he said, this generation worships me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. See, it's not just about singing. It's about opening our hearts up to God and revering Him and lifting Him up 
Nothing is more repugnant to God than people going through the motions of worship and their heart is disconnected from Him. The time is coming and now is now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking. So the first thing is start with worship. Start with, it doesn't even have, it's not music. There were no uh, organs playing when Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's it's reverencing and, and lifting up God for who he is, so different than who we are. Here's the second thing. Fully surrender. Fully surrender to God. Jesus, again, is the, is the picture of this being fully surrendered, and we need to do this on a daily basis. Lord, I, I just surrender my day to you. I, I surrender my thoughts. I surrender my desires to you. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, we see the beautiful picture of Jesus here in the garden. Look at what it says, going a little further, He fell on his face. This is Jesus in the garden before he's betrayed in the garden. Then he's taken to the cross and he's crucified. He's he's whipped, he's beaten, he's crucified. And then, of course, three days later, uh, after he's put in the tomb, three days later, he's raised from the dead. But he knows what's about to happen. It says, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Now that's not the first time that he prayed that. He prayed that in the model prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught us to pray thy will. God's will be done in my life every single day. Every day. Let me put it this way. So many times, in our lives, we have the choice. Turn to the mirror and think about ourselves or turn to the cross and think about Jesus. Not my will, yours be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus prayed this prayer daily and in the heat of the moment, here's the thing, you and I will default to our daily routines we will default to what is the most practiced thing in our lives, what we've done in the past. And when Jesus falls on his face, what does he say? What he said every single day in prayer, not my will, yours be done. In essence, rephrasing, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus surrendered every day and that's how, why he was able to surrender on the cross. In Luke chapter 23, verse 46, what did he say? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus surrendered every day. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not mine. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he's in the garden and he knows what's going what's to happen to him, not my will. Yours be done. And then on the cross, Luke 23, 26, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus surrendered that final day on the cross because he had surrendered every single day. That's one of the things the disciples noticed about his life. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever fully surrendered to God? Have you ever fully surrendered and said, God, not my will. Yours be done. Whatever is your will, Lord, that's what I want to do. See, that's relationship. That's a prayer that's birthed out of relationship, a daily routine. You know, when I was coaching uh, high school football, uh, there's an old kind of catchphrase, buzz, you know, phrases that are repeated over and over and over. One of them is, you play like you practice. You play like you practice. Because it's through the routine of practice that then in the game situation when something happens you weren't planning on, you default back to what you did routinely in practice. It's the same way with prayer or the lack thereof. What we practice on a daily basis is the way when the chips are down, what came out of Jesus? 
Father, not my will, yours be done. Because that was his weekly, that was his daily routine to surrender on a regular basis. Here's the third thing, and I think this may be one of the toughest ones uh, when it comes to prayer. Uh, f- first of all, we see that we want to start with worship and then fully surrender. And, and I said, this is one, number three, maybe the toughest one. Pray with confidence. Pray with confidence. Now, how can we pray with confidence? But let's look at this first of all. Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16 says, you and I are to pray with confidence. How can we be confident? Let's look at it. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest, it's referring to Jesus, who is unable to empathize, not sympathize. There's a big difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy is, I feel so sorry for you. Empathy is, I've been there, I've experienced what you're experiencing, I know what you're going through. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Jesus faced every single temptation to sin that you and I ever face, that we'll ever face in our life. Just as we are, yet. That's a powerful three-letter word. Yet, he did not sin. Then he goes on and it says, let us then, because Jesus has faced every temptation that you and I will ever face, Yet he'd never sinned. He always withstood it. Let us approach God's throne of grace. That's what his throne is, of grace. It's not of of, uh, perfection. It's not a throne of you've got to be perfect. You have to be without sin to approach me. It's a throne of grace with what? Confidence. The Bible makes it clear that we're to approach God's throne with confidence. Confidence. Not confidence in ourselves, but confidence in who? The great high priest, Jesus, they were just talking about. Because he is the perfect high priest. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so the Bible makes it clear. There it is, and I had him highlight that. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Are you confident when you pray? We're supposed to be confident when we pray. We can approach God directly with confidence. Notice what it says there. Let us approach who? The pastor, the priest. No, it's not what the Bible says. Let us go, let's let's approach God in prayer. Let us approach God's throne with grace and confidence. How do we pray with confidence? I want to give you real real quick, this isn't on the notes here, but two practical ways that we can approach God in confidence. Here's the first way. Can't get any more practical than this. Pray out loud. Pray out loud. That there is something about, you say, well, God knows my thoughts. Yeah, he does. He does. But there's something about when your voice, when your own ear hears your own voice praying to God, it it changes. It's with confidence. Can you imagine? I mean, uh, my my wife Susie and I have been married for 25 years, and there are times that that, that I, I can look at her. I know what she's thinking. But you know what? What kind of fool would I be if I didn't ask? I I need to talk. There needs to be communication back and forth. And and there's something about, this was a real struggle for me until I started doing, just pray out loud. Find a place where you can just pray out loud. So important. I remember in college, I I used to find a time where, where I could just go and walk where nobody would hear me. Maybe you need to walk around your neighborhood. And yeah, people might think you're a little bit crazy when you're walking. You, You know, or something like that. Here's another thing. You know what? Guarantee, you, if, 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 if I ever talk to you on the phone, you can, you listen, you could, you could go to the bank, you could make a bet on this. I'm walking. I'm pacing. That's just how I talk. I, I just always, walk. when I'm on the phone, I just talk. I walk, 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 walk. There's something about when I'm walking, I just, it helps me to talk. It's really hard, actually, uh, even now with all this recording that we do, because I'm like... <coughs> I'm just like, I'm stuck right here. I can't walk. But I used to walk, pace, all over the place. It just, it, it's easier for me to talk. So begin to pray out loud. Go find a place where you can just pray out loud. It's so important. You say, well, God already knows my thoughts. Yes, he does. But he wants to hear your voice. 
You know, there are times when I just want to hear my kids say, I love you, Daddy. Do I know they love me? Yeah, I know it. But man, when they say, Daddy, I love you. Same way with God. He knows our thoughts. He wants to hear our voice. So pray. Pray. He wants to hear what you have to say. First thing is pray out loud. Here's the second thing that I would say. Uh, really, and I just already said, walk around. Find a posture of prayer that helps you to stay focused. That's what I mean by walk around. Maybe your thing's not walking around. Maybe your thing is kneeling. Maybe that's going to help you focus. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's uh, doing jumping jacks while you pray. I don't, I don't know what it is. You know, but whatever it is, find whatever that posture is that's going to help you to stay focused. Pray out loud. Pray out loud and walk around or find a posture of prayer that will help you stay focused. And I just want to say it again because as I was studying, just putting this together, man, it just kind of shot through me when I started typing this. God already knows your thoughts, but he wants to hear your voice. So pray. Pray. James chapter 5, verse 16. says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The earnest prayer, the earnest, the passionate, just letting it out. Say it. Say it to God with confidence. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And, and, and here's another pointer as we're talking about praying with confidence. Matthew 6, 7, and 8, Jesus warns his disciples about prayer. And he says, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, blah, 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 just going on and on and on and on and on. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Listen, let me just be, a, if, if, if I'm ever having dinner at your house or you invite me out to dinner and, and, and I say, go ahead and bless the food. Listen, I don't care what your theology is. The food's getting hot. The food's getting cold. <laughs> I, you're just going on and on and, and blessed are the birds and thank you for the grass and all that stuff. I want to eat. Don't be like the pagans. They just think they, they're going to impress with their many words. God isn't impressed with our many words. Don't be like them, for the Father knows what you need before you ask him. Just keep it simple. God, this is what I need. Don't try to pray. You ever been, you ever been around somebody praying and you get the feeling, are they talking to God? Are they trying to impress the heck out of me? Because I'm annoyed with them. I just like them to stop. Just shut up, please. <laughs> Jesus warns about that. It's not supposed to be that way. And now I know some of you are saying, can you just shut up and finish this message? But anyway, <laughs> here's the fourth thing. Here's the fourth thing now. All right, I'm glad. I'm, we can, it's good that we can laugh, isn't it? <laughs> what that means is the message is hitting the mark. That's what it means. Here's the fourth thing. Make it personal, not formal. Make it personal, not formal, not, not rote, not ritualistic. You know how bored I get? My wife Susie said the same exact thing to me every single day and nothing more. It's conversational. It's developed, and I know for, for, for some of us, it, it, this is something prayer, you get better at it the more you do it. The more you do it. Listen, the first time I got behind the wheel of a car, when I was a teenager, my dad's teaching me to drive. I'd like to think I'm a little bit better at driving today than I, than I was that first time. Well, what did you do? You practiced it. And you get better, and you get better, and you get better. Some of us get better at driving, and others don't. <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about you. But anyway, <laughs> make it personal, not formal. It's a conversation. And it feels a little awkward at first. But, but, but again, I, I think there's something to praying out loud even. And, and, and it helps you to focus when you do pray out loud. Because it's like having a conversation. It is a conversation that you're having. 
It's not just thoughts and your thoughts just wander. It helps you to focus. The posture of prayer, beginning with, with worship, fully surrendering and praying with confidence, and then making it personal. That's what relationship prayer is really all about. Now, now let me end with this. End the message with this. Maybe you're here and you're like, you know what? Greg, you're talking about relationship prayer. I don't have a relationship with God. You can start today. It starts simply when you when you acknowledge, you know what? There's stuff I've done in my life that, yeah, maybe I'm ashamed of and embarrassed by and where I know I've done things I shouldn't have done. But Jesus, he did everything he was supposed to. He was perfect and without sin. And he who didn't deserve to die for his sin died in my place. He laid his life down. He sacrificed himself for me. And he rose again three days later from the tomb. And so because of that, because he paid the price for our sins, we can have a relationship with God. Not because we're perfect, not because we'll ever earn it, but because Jesus paid it all, paid it in full. And so even today, right now, simply saying, Jesus, praying. By the way, there, there's no hands like this in the Bible when it comes to prayer either. Check it out. You won't find it anywhere. It's not in there. Simply praying, Father, I receive what Jesus Christ did on the cross for me. That he paid the price for my sins, past, present, and future. And I receive forgiveness from you because of what he did, his perfect life and death and his resurrection. And I just turn from those sins and I just trust you with my life and I surrender my life to you. And then that's the start of that relationship, that growing relationship. How does it continue to grow? What we're talking about is one of the primary ways, through prayer. M maybe you're here today and, and you'd say, you know what, I remember when. Many, many years ago, when I had that close relationship with God, I don't really know what happened. It just seemed like I kind of drifted away. It seemed like things that were important to me about God and my relationship with Him, I just, I didn't care for Him maybe the way that I should have, and I just drifted away. Well, what a great opportunity in response to this message, teach us to pray, the difference to really get back on track in that relationship again. How do I do that, Greg? I think it starts by praying. It starts by praying. See, here's the thing. When we drift away from God, it's so important that we remember He didn't move, we did. He didn't drift away from us, we drifted from Him. How do we reconnect again? Through prayer. No better way than through prayer. And so you know what I'd like to do right now? pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your, for your word. Lord, we thank you that Jesus responded when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught us, he gave us a model that we can follow called the Lord's Prayer. Not what to pray, but how to pray. Lord, for many of us, when it comes to this subject of prayer, there, it does feel like something's missing, and, and, and the truth be told, it's, it's probably that relationship prayer instead of rescue prayer. As important as rescue prayer is, that it's relationship prayer that keeps us going through thick and thin. And so, Father, help us by your Holy Spirit as we start with worship and prayer, as we as we fully surrender as Jesus taught us how to, not, your, not our will, but your will be done. Help us, Lord, to really come to you in confidence, knowing that we can come directly to you and find that posture of prayer 
that we could actually, wherever that is, that we could actually speak out loud. You already know our thoughts, but you want to hear our voice and that we would begin to pray. And Lord, thank you that we don't have to pray prayers in King James English, but Father, we can pray in clear, everyday communication and knowing that you hear us and that you love us and that you will answer us. Thank you, Father, that you've given us this incredible gift of communication with you called prayer. We're grateful. And may we use it daily. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.